Alrighty. If we can all turn to 1 Kings chapter 16, we, we will be continuing our study. We will be reading from verses 29 to chapter 17, verse 1. So, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29. Now Ahab the son of Omri became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh more than all who were before him. Now it happened as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that he took Jezebel the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, as a wife, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar of uh, for Baal in the house of Baal, or Baal, excuse me, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke Yahweh the God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hill, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid its foundations with the loss of Abraham, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his younger son, Segab, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by the hand of Joshua, the son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead said to Ahab, As Yahweh the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So the history of Israel reminds me of the times that we are living in today. We are living in a world where no longer is Yahweh feared, but society is doing what is right in their own eyes. We no longer have respect for authority. People are praised for doing uh, whatever they want. There is no longer punishment for breaking the law. You have broken family and you just see sin running rampant in today's society. You know, just the other day I read that a six-year-old shot his teacher and you wonder what his parents are doing in his life. And you also have California, where it is now a sanctioned place for kids that want to transition their gender. And parents can't do anything about it legally. And we find ourselves in a very similar place with Israel. Israel is in their darkest hour. The whole nation is being perverted with idolatry. And if we trace back to the seven kings, what we notice is a sad and tragic course between them all. A sin is continually being committed against Yahweh. And it all begins with the reign of Jeroboam. If you remember his account, he fears losing his people um, to the worship of God in Jerusalem, which gives him the idea to make worship more convenient by creating two golden calves. If you, if you go back with me to 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, we see the account. So the king took counsel and made two golden calves. And he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and one he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made house on high places and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam made a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah, and he went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel to sacrifice to the calves which he had made, and he had the priests of the high places which he made stand in Bethel. So what we see here is the consequences of unrepentant sin through the reign of multiple kings. We see his son Nadab, which scripture describes him as a king who did evil inside of Yahweh. 
In 1 Kings 15, 26, it says, He did what was evil inside of Yahweh and walked in the way of his father and in his sin, which he made Israel sin. He then is succeeded by a man named Basha, who also does evil inside of Yahweh and is judged for murdering Nadab. Then Elah, who was a drunkard, is murdered by Zimri, who is guilty of treason, and because of that, the army of Israel makes Omri the king, and unfortunately, Omri too does evil in, in the sight of Yahweh. And in the eyes of the world, Omri was as successful of a leader second to Solomon, but spiritually he was destroying Israel. And no longer was Israel fearing Yahweh, but was heading towards a nation that did what was right in its own eyes. And now we are introduced to a new king, the son of Omri, Ahab, who is no be better than his father. And in fact, the author says he is worse than his father. He is worse than the kings that came before him. So Israel is in its darkest times, darkest hour, and the nation is in sin because of its idolatry. And what we're going to look at tonight is what a godless nation looks like. What a godless nation looks like. And we see this in Israel. The first point is a godless nation does not fear, fear Yahweh. A godless nation does not fear Yahweh. We find this in verses 29 and 30. The second point is a godless nation ignores the law of God, ignores the law of God. And we find this in verses 31 through 33. Third point, a godless nation defies the law of God. And we find this in verse 34, defies the law of God. And lastly, in a godless, godless nation, there is hope for God's people. And we find this in verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. In a godless nation, there is hope for God's people. So let's take a look at the first point in what a godless nation looks like. And this is a nation that does not fear God. Verse 29. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh more than all who were before him. So what we have here is now some stability in both the nation and the throne. Omri passes away and Ahab is now handed over the kingship. Ahab is receiving the kingdom from his father in the, in the best shape of his time since Jeroboam's reign. Israel is flourishing as we have learned from our last study on Omri. And to recap, Omri was a smart king. He knew what he wanted and how to make Israel flourish under his reign. In the world's eye, Israel was a great nation and with many things flourishing like their name, their market, their new capital in Samaria. Everything was going well. And this is what Ahab was inheriting. The only thing that was lacking here was the fear of Yahweh. The author of 1 Kings tells us that Omri did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh and acted more wickedly acted more wicked than all who were before him. How? For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sins, which he made Israel sin, provoking Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger with their idols. So Omri held the title for being the worst king. But then his son comes along. In verse 30, it says, Ahab did what was evil inside of Yahweh, more than all who were before him. So no longer does Omri hold a, hold a crown of being the worst king, but that crown is now being passed down also to his son Ahab. Ahab is now the worst king that came before anyone because he did evil inside of Yahweh. And Ahab will go down in history as one of the worst kings to ever live due to his action because he lacked the fear of Yahweh. When a nation is run by a king who lacks the fear of Yahweh, then the nation is in trouble. The nation will be in its darkest hour, and everything will seem like it's headed towards the damnation. A nation that is ruled by wicked leaders will lead its nation down on a wicked path. So the first point we see in the godless nation 
is a king who does not fear Yahweh. In fact, he did more evil than the kings that came before him. Now, the second point we see in, godless, in, a, in a godless nation is a godless, godless nation ignores the law of God. And we find this in verses 31 through 33. Ignores the law of God. Verse 31. Excuse me. Now it happened as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of Sidonians, as a wife, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So, so we now have the reason why Ahab was a man who did e evil in the sight of Yahweh more than all who were before him. The author is asking the question, was walking in Jeroboam's sin not enough that you end up marrying an unbeliever? Not only was she not a believer of Yahweh, but one of the most prominent cult leaders of Baal. We can assume that Ahab married Jezebel for the purpose of political alliances, but because of that, the nation now will face the consequences of his decision. Now, who was Ethbal? Well, Ethbal was the king of Sidonians and became a king by committing treason. He murdered the king who was before him and through that came into power. And notice how both his and his daughters, Jezebel's name, end with Baal and Bel. This signifies how much they loved their religion, how much they were addicted to their cult, to their God. And this is similar to when believers decide to name their children after biblical names to remind them of God. So he, as a father who loves Baal, names his daughter after their God, Baal. Now, the reason why the text tells us that Ahab was the most evil king is because he will be the reason why the nation of Israel's religion is no longer about Yahweh, but is going to be dominated by the worship of Baal. Jezebel, who is leading the worship of Baal, will start to persecute the priests and all the believers in the nation. It will be to a point where she is trying to kill all believers, as we will see in the future chapters, all believers, believers of Yahweh, but God will protect them by a prophet named Obadiah, who will, who will hide all the prophets. The nation is going to be ran by thousands of Baal worshippers and their priests. And no longer is a nation a nation of Yahweh, but a nation of Baal. And as a reminder, this isn't the first time Baal is being worshipped in, in, in Israel. But this is the first where Baal worship is the main religion in Israel. The moment Jezebel was wedded to the king of Israel, the whole nation was going to experience the worship of idols because she was wholly devoted to the worship of Baal. So what does Ahab do? He erects an altar in Baal in Samaria. The idol worship, this idol worship is in a prominent position where it, it is now easily accessible for all to see and worship. Just like how Yahweh's temple was built in Judah's capital, so Ahab also decides to build its God's temple in the capital of Samaria. And verse 33 says that he not only worshipped Baal, but also made Asherah. And if you remember this, um, idol Asherah, she was the goddess of fertility, fertility, and this goddess now is being brought back into Israel. And verse 33 ends again by saying, Ahab did more to provoke Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So why did this particular event provoke Yahweh more than any other kings. You know, when Jeroboam created his idol, it wasn't blat it wasn't a blatant idol. It was meant for people to have easy access to Yahweh. 
but it was done in a wrong manner. So that's why it was a sin and an idol. But here, what we're seeing is something that is worse than that. What we are seeing here is someone who deliberately ignores the word of God, marries an outsider, and because of that, this outsider brings her package of idolatry into the nation and leads Israel astray. In Exodus 2, God's command is very clear on what his people or what he expects from the nation and his people. His very first command is this, that you shall have no other gods before me. And right after that, the second command is, you shall make no idols. And yet, we see Ahab breaking both commands. For Ahab, Baal is his primary god, having other gods before Yahweh, and then building a temple for the nation to worship Baal. Ahab also ignored the warning that was given to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 11, 1-2. God was very clear when he said to Solomon not to intermarry with other nations. Why? Because they were going to bring in their gods and turn your heart away from Yahweh. And that is exactly what we are seeing in, in, the, in the nation of Israel. And yet we see Ahab ignoring God's law. He's ignoring God's law and proceeding his life as if God does not exist. The law and the command was very clear. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols. And that you shall not intermarry with other nations. And yet, the law was ignored. Jezebel wanted to practice her religion in Israel, and that's what she does. She brings in her own Baal, um, Baal worshippers. She tries to remove Yahweh by destroying the altars and his prophets. And the outcome of all this is ignoring God's word, marrying a woman who hates Yahweh, who will lead their nation to no longer fearing him. But all the blame is not on Jezebel. But the blame is also on Ahab. Ahab wasn't just passive. He wasn't just sitting back watching Jezebel do her thing. But he too also hated God. He hated how he would receive negative feedbacks, revelations from Yahweh's prophets. So it was blatantly obvious that they both did not fear Yahweh. Even though Jezebel was the driving force of the whole worship in the kingdom, it was Ahab as a king who allowed this to happen by ignoring the word of God. When you ignore the word of God, nothing good comes out of it. God told all of Israel not to have other gods before them, not to make idols, not to intermarry, but Ahab ignores all his commands all of it, and now the nation is in great judgment. The consequence of not listening to the word of God is judgment, and because of that, Israel is now in trouble. And this is a great reminder to all of us here today, that when we do have other gods, that when we do have idols in our lives, eventually God will no longer tolerate our sins, and his wrath will be poured out onto us greatly. So the second point we saw in a godless nation was that they ignore the law of God. We see Ahab ignoring the first two commandments given to Israel and ignoring the law that Yahweh gave to Solomon by intermarrying and bringing in an idol that would turn their hearts of men away from Yahweh. And next, we see the third point in what a godless nation looks like, which is they defy the law of God. And we find this in verse 34 defies the law of God. Verse 34. In his days, Hill, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid his foundations with the loss of Abraham, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of Yahweh, 
which he spoke by the hand of Joshua, the son of Nun. So Jericho was given to the northern kingdom after the split of the two, uh, after the split of the nations, and and was a strategic site that was located at the southeast corner of Israel, Israel and west of the Jordan. King Ahab most likely wanted to fortify Jericho for the defense purposes and to keep the Moabs in check. And Heel was tasked by Ahab to rebuild Jericho. And then the word built here can be translated more accurately as rebuild or to fortify. But there was one thing that they were missing. The prophecy from Joshua according, uh, regarding the rebuild of Jericho. So turn with me to Joshua 6, chapter 6, verse 26. And here we, we, we see the account of what happened in Jericho. And to get the context, Moses just passed away. Moses just passed away and now Joshua is in charge. God has promised Joshua that their destination will be uh, the promised land and Jericho will be given to them. And if you remember the, the story, the narrative, Joshua the, uh, people of, Joshua, the people of Israel, and the priests marched around Jericho seven times, the city seven times, and on the seventh time, the people shout, the fortified walls fall, and they are able to now take the city. They burn everything in the city with fire, and then Joshua makes an oath, which lands us in verse 26. Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Then Joshua made them swear an oath at that time, saying, Cursed before Yahweh is the man who rise up and builds the city Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation, and with the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up its gate. So this was the prophecy that Joshua gave to whomever builds the city Jericho again. That they will lose their firstborn and that they will lose their youngest for rebuilding the city. And in verse 34 here, what we're seeing is the prophecy coming true. Whether they knew this prophecy or not, the builder here loses his firstborn and loses his youngest because of this. And this was the typical style of reign for Ahab. He didn't care about God's word, and he only did what was right in his own eye. I mean, look at today's church around us. We have so many pa pastors who ignore God's word and tries to appropriate themselves with society. I mean, if you just drive down the street, you have churches raising their LGBTQT plus whatever flags, saying that they support all gender, supporting they uh, stating that they support transgender, etc., while ignoring what the Word of God says. We have other pastors who say things like the Bible should receive no more reverence than any other book. Sorry, should receive no more reverence than any other books. And you wonder why this nation no longer fears God, no longer fears Yahweh. No longer are there godly men who fear Yahweh and teach the scripture in an expository manner, but have men and women up in that pulpit preaching a feel-good message. And in the same way, we have Ahab doing whatever he wants. Doing whatever he wants in order to achieve his goals, rather than honoring Yahweh. His actions are no longer dictated by scripture. He simply follows his own desires. When you are in defiance of God's word, you will see judgment in your life. No longer are you living for Yahweh, but now you are going against him. You know, no wonder we see so much sin in today's society. Everywhere, everywhere we go, every movie we see, there's just sin after sin because no longer is God's word being taught. But what's being taught is to be defiant to all that you have learned. You are to forget God's word because it's ancient. It's 
You are to just live your life the way you want because that's how God created you. And that's the message that we hear all the time. But as believers, may that never be in your life. But may we live in reverence to God's word, in obedience and in fear. So the third point we saw in a godless nation was that they defy the law of God. That they defy the law of God. We see Ahab defying the oath that was given to Joshua by rebuilding Jericho at any cost. But we must remember, as believers, where there are dark times ahead, there will always be hope for those who fear Yahweh. That there will be hope for all believers who fear Yahweh. And this leads us to our fourth point. We see, what well, um, fourth point, that there is hope for God's people in a godless nation. That there is hope for God's people. So we just looked at three points on what a godless nation looks like. And if we stop there, everything may seem dark. It may seem like it gets no better for believers. But what we know is that there is always hope for believers because God is a God who takes care of his children. And in chapter 17, verse 1, is the hope for all believers in Israel. And in verse 1, we are abruptly introduced to our next prophet, Elijah. There is no real introduction for him except where he is from. His introduction is different from all, all the other prophets that came before him. You know, all the, all the other prophets have a short introduction, have a short bio on who they are, who their parents were, where they're from, and, and what their task was, or what they were going to be used as. But for Elijah, there is none. But yet, we read that there is hope for Israel, that God will send Elijah to judge the nation and to call them back to Yahweh. So let us close with an introduction of Elijah, chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As Yahweh the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So God now raises up a powerful messenger for himself. A powerful witness in a man who is abruptly introduced to us, a man named Elijah. And scripture tells us that he was a settler of Gilead where it's located east of the Jordan. And it was in the wild hills covered with forests. And Gilead was a place that was rough. It was not easy. It wasn't an easy place to live in. The people that lived in these tough places also reflected that in their nature. A.W. Pink, a commentator, says that they were rough and rugged, solemn and stern, dwelling in rude villages and subsisting by keeping flocks of sheep. We don't have a lot of information about Elijah. We don't know what age he became a follower of Yahweh. But there is one sentence in chapter 19 that defines who Elijah was. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10, it says this. It says about Elijah, I have been very zealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts. Elijah's whole purpose in life was to glorify God. And that honoring Yahweh's name meant more to him than anything else. So as he hears the news about what is going on in Israel, we know because he is zealous for God that he is deeply grieved with the idolatry that is going on in Israel. There is no doubt that Elijah was deeply rooted and familiar with, the, uh, with Scripture, especially the first, first few books of the Old Testament. His heart must have been in despair knowing what Ahab did with Jezebel. How Jezebel was there breaking down God's altar slaying his servants and replacing them with her own priest. And knowing all this, you know, he must have felt furious. He must have felt 
he must have been upset because we know that he was zealous for Yahweh. He wanted to act and he knew he had to do something. He knew he had to confront it. Though he knew he needed to confront the sin, the question he must have asked himself was, what can he do? You know, as a countryman, as a, as a man that is now living in the nation, away from the nation, what can he do? And, you know, knowing this, Satan probably even tempted him by whispering in his ears that he, he, he could do nothing for he was a nobody. But scripture tells us that there was one thing that he, he knew he could do, which was to pray. In James chapter 5, 17, it tells us that he prayed earnestly. That he was a man of prayer. Even though he knew he couldn't do anything in his own power, he knew he could pray. So he prayed. He prayed because he realized that God was in control of every situation. He prayed because he was weak and insufficient to do anything for God. He prayed to turn to God and be strengthened by Him who is infinitely self-sufficient. So he prayed that he did. He prayed that there will be a drought, that there will be neither dew nor rain. Elijah was zealous for Yahweh. His values was on Yahweh. And all that he could do was pray that it might not rain. And now Elijah here is tasked to go and confront Ahab. He knows the road is going to be rough. But because of his deal, uh, zeal for Yahweh, he knows he needs to go to Ahab and confront him regarding his sins. And this was the hope that was given to Israel by God. A man who will confront Ahab and Jezebel to turn the nation's heart away from Baal and towards Yahweh again. And as we continue our study, Elijah is going to be the number one target for Ahab and Jezebel. He will be the man who will confront the idols and show the whole nation that God is the one true God. So even though a nation may seem like they are in the darkest hour or time, there will always be hope for all believers. Believers who are zealous for God will, will never tolerate sin, but instead they will confront it. Believers will continually pray. They will preach the good news to the lost so that they will come to know Christ, trusting that God will change the nation. So even during these darkest times, there will be hope for all believers. So we have just looked at what a godless nation looks like. A godless nation does not fear Yahweh. A godless nation ignores the law of God. A godless nation defies the law of God. And lastly, in a godless nation, there is hope for God's people. It may seem like we are living in the darkest times of our lives in this nation, but let's not lose hope as children of God, for God will send an Elijah to confront the sins of this nation. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are just thankful for the hope that you have given us, even during these difficult times, these dark times where sin is just living rampant, where men no longer fear you, but rather they fear each one another. Where if you say things that, are, that go against the society, that you will be judged, that you will be canceled. But Lord, we know that one day that you will send a prophet like Elijah, but he, who is even better, your son, who will come back to reclaim his throne and with them declare the nation as yours. So until that day, Lord, may we be like Elijah, bold and zealous, men and women of prayer who will, who will not tolerate sin, but confront it when we see it. And as we, as we do, Lord, may you be honored and glorified. So we thank you for this time in your name, pray.